The nominees for Fear of the Year this year are Fear of Insects and Spiders, Fear of Heights, Fear of the Dark, Fear of Public Speaking, and Fear of Clowns. And the Fear of the Year Award goes to, if someone has the envelope, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Fear public speaking. Thank you. Fear of public speaking. <clears throat> it appears that fear of public speaking uh, is unable to attend this award ceremony yet again, but has sent these regards. <clears throat> Thank you for this award, although I win it every year, I never take it for granted, and I'm always grateful to each and every one of you. As long as we have brains, we are going to be afraid of public speaking. And I know that only too well. Fear of the year will always go to public speaking. It's also known as glossophobia, which I thought was kind of cute, but really doesn't make it any easier to take the panic out of. And tonight I want to share with you my personal struggle with public speaking and, and fear and anxiety. I want to share with you why you'll always be afraid of public speaking and what you can do about it. And finally, I want to give you six really useful techniques that you can plug into your next presentation. So I am just like you, and I am going to cover why we're all afraid, and I will give you those six rules. But first, let me tell you my story. I was OK until I was six. I was a happy little kid, rambunctious, probably hyperactive. But my entire world fell apart when I had to go to school. And I'm from Alberta, and we started school in grade one. We didn't have primary or, or kindergarten like everybody else seemed to have. <laughs> But by the time I started grade one, I developed a really severe problem. I had gastrointestinal problems, stomach aches that were so debilitating that I couldn't go to school. And we weren't sure if I had some you know, genetic problem with my inners. And it meant I couldn't go to school. And I was in severe pain. So my parents did the right thing. They took me to the doctors. And nobody knew about separation anxiety in the early 60s. They just thought maybe I had a really severe problem. So they elevated me to a pediatrician, and I went through a battery of tests. And well, the good thing is I didn't have to go to school. So I was fine. I had a little bit of pain and had a whole bunch of tests. And I was good until the last test. And the last test was so horrible that I snapped out of my pain cycle with my stomach. And so I'm going to tell you what they did, all right? Because really, this is what happens when we have one fear, and it gets really overrun by another fear. I didn't mind the barium milkshake scan. It tasted chalky, and it tasted a little radioactive. But you know, it wasn't so bad. It was strawberry, and, and I, I had a choice. It was chocolate or strawberry. That test was fine. It was the one after that where I had to drink this big jug of something or other that didn't taste very good, and then go to the hospital by myself on the stainless steel counter of some sort. And then it happened. I could hear the suction turn on. And then some kind of little tube was inserted to the back side of my body, and I'm not going to say where. And they began to excavate whatever was inside of me. Well, to this day, when I hear a vacuum cleaner, it sends shivers up my spine. I decided on that table right then and there, I was not going to let those stomach aches continue. So off I went to school. But the problem was I was still scared and nervous. It didn't go away. And so I turned into that little kid that talks too much. You know, the one at the back of the class who will never shut up. And then the teacher moves them to the front of the class, and they still don't shut up. Now, I know there's some people smiling, some professors smiling here. I took my fear and anxiety, and I just converted into chattiness. So I never actually had any great coping skills. But what my parents noticed is after school, when I was singing and dancing and performing in community plays, I was fine. I was fine. What I didn't know, and I know now, is all of that 
was a way for me to channel fear and anxiety. And it turns out what I learned in singing and dancing and being in community plays and performing was exactly what I needed to know about taking the panic out of public speaking. But I did promise my parents. I said, really, I'm sure somehow, someday, I will turn this crazy problem that I have into something good. And eventually, I found places for me to get paid to speak. So let's talk about why we're afraid. Why, why, why? And if you don't know why, you won't know that there's a great solution to this. And here's why. Because you have a primitive part in your brain. It's your reptilian brain. And you probably know in your studies a much better name for it. But it is that little piece of you that says, if there's danger, you've got to run for your life. You've got to fight. It's your fight flight response, right? Or freeze and appease. And you will always have that. And it will never go away. And the truth is, it gets activated all the time. And mine today got activated knowing that I was going to talk to you today. I told myself I don't need to be afraid. But my, prim my primitive brain, it doesn't matter. It says, oh my god, you're in front of people. And if they don't like you, you're going to die. Right? That's the primitive brain. And you can't stop that primitive brain. You can't medicate it. You can't drug it to death. You can try. You can't punish it. And you can't talk yourself out of it. And there's no need to. And here's what that primitive brain will do. How many are, who, who shakes when they're nervous? Who says shakers? Where's my shakers? Yeah. My friend Jocelyn said, tell the shakers to wear clothing that doesn't show their body shaking. I thought that was really good advice. I don't know. Whose voice cracks when they stand up? Yeah, well, there's my crackers. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Um, who gets a pounding heart? Look at this beautiful pounding heart. Yeah. Uh, who has excessive sweating? Sweating. Not so many people want to admit to that. We do have deodorant. Yeah. The beautiful thing about your primitive brain is it responds really well to oxygen. And you're the scientist. You tell me. So I want to show you. And what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to stand up. So if you've got your trays in front of you a little bit harder, but I want you to stand up because I want to show you the number one trick of how to take panic out of public speaking. And it's a physical trick. All right. So. Who knows about their diaphragm? Does anybody know about the diaphragm? Did you all get that? So a few people know your diaphragm. So if you know where your diaphragm is, put your hand on it. Yeah, right about here. Perfect, perfect. And does our diaphragm go this way or this way? Does anybody know? Is it like an accordion this way? Yeah, it lifts up. Yeah, perfect. OK. So we're going to hold our hands just like that. And I call it the 5-5-5 five, five, five breathing thing breathing thing. Breathe in for five seconds, hold it for five seconds, and let it come out like a little snake going for five. So here's your diaphragm. It's going to look like this. Breathe in. Hold it. One, two, three, four, five, and slowly out. All right, we're going to do it again, just like an accordion. Breathe in. Hold it. And it out. That one maneuver will calm down a panic brain every time. One more time. Hold it and let it out. OK, have a seat. Forever in a day, when you have to present or you're feeling panicked, do your body a favor. Give it the oxygen, the nitric oxide. Let it bathe your brain, because that will tell your primitive brain everything is OK. You might think, oh, yeah, whatever, it's just the breath. Yeah, no, it's not. I don't know one professional, not one actor, not one professional speaker, no matter how high you go, and I've seen some really heavy hitters who do not practice deep, conscious, controlled breathing to manage their panic. If you take away one thing, take away that and out. And you won't do it unless you practice it. So find a part in your life when you're blow drying your hair or putting on your makeup, when you're at the gym, when you're walking to class. Find a time in your day where you at least three times a day do whatever, right? But train your brain to do conscious breathing. 
So my dad was a minister of a big, huge church in Calgary, near U University of Calgary, and he did up to three to four weddings every Saturday. I'm telling you, I was making a lot of money vacuuming up confetti. <laughs> but he taught me, when he counseled the bride before, he talked to her about her breath. So he would take the nervous bride's hand, and you know, the nervous bride always falls in love with my dad because she's nervous. He hold her hand and whatever. Um, and I know that because at my high school reunion, nobody knew me, but they knew my dad. Oh, I love your dad. I love your dad. They loved my dad because he held their hands, and he taught them how to control their breath. Conscious control of your breath, but you need to practice it every day so it's available to you when you need it on demand. Anybody here, a bre any musicians or singers? Yeah, so you know exactly what I mean, don't you? Yeah. yeah. You also need that breath to take your words to the end of your sentence. So the singers are lucky in this room. Or are reed instruments, anybody play a reed instrument or any instruments? Okay, right. You know about breath control. But anybody can learn it. Five, five, five. And oxygen is, costs you nothing. I could end the presentation on just teaching you to breathe. But I'm not going to, because I got super, super fun techniques for, for effective public speaking. And I've based this on uh, Dr. Gary Gennard's work, who's a PhD in performing arts, because he was really in alignment with what I learned as a little kid, singing, dancing, and performing. Turns out it's perfect for public speaking. Number one. Make the audience the focus of your presentation. Make the audience the center of your universe. I didn't know that. I thought it was all about me. When I think it's all about me, I'm scared, right? Because if it's all about me, it's all about me. I don't know if you like me or you don't like me or remember my words. But when it's about you, I'm not nervous. And when you're talking to your audience, when you are talking and it's about them, you're not going to think about being scared. Great way to take the fear to public speaking is make the audience the center of your universe. Do not wait as long as I did, because my ego, thinking it's about me, was one of my biggest mistakes. Maya Angelou, mentor to Oprah Winfrey, Freedom of Medal Award winner woman, 2010, Barack Obama, president, gave it to her, said, you don't know what you don't know. And I wish someone told me when I was your age, it wasn't about me. What? What do you mean it's not about me? It's about the people I serve? Oh, well, when I figured that out, almost 30, two children later, I was offered the most incredible opportunities as a singer to perform. And I was one of the featured leads opening the Variety Club Telethon in Vancouver for three years because I knew it wasn't about me and that my performing was about helping others, and we would raise 25 to $30 million a year because it was about the sick kids of British Columbia. Rule number two, really easy for women, focus on relationships. You don't think that as you're getting your data together and your thesis and all your great stuff, as you're preparing your presentation, you want to keep your focus on three things. First of all, your relationship to your audience because your audience is the center of your your universe. Number two, develop a relationship to your message. Develop a relationship to your data, to your information, to your thesis, to your outcomes. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And then, once you're connected to it, once you have a relationship to it, you will then be able to deliver it to your audience. You are the midwife of your message. The audience cannot get your message if you are disconnected from it. The minute it's personal, the minute you have an investment in that message, when you deliver that, the audience will get it. It's magic, and here's how it works. First of all, just tell them a story. Tell them a story. Maybe it's your own personal story. Maybe it's a story of someone you know or you love, or you've heard a really good story, and all of you are witnesses to great stories. If you're not ready to tell your own, that's okay. I'm 51, I could finally talk about having stomach aches and getting an enema when I was a kid. It's taken me that long. But tell someone else's story that you care about. Tell them a story because of neural coupling. Who knows about neural coupling? Yeah, you wanna know about this. Or, as the slide my daughter presented is, you wanna know about brain sync. 
When I tell you a story, I touch the primitive part of your brain, the brain that we would have sat around the circle in, and you would have listened, and your brain lights up. We know this with functional MRIs. Your brain, when I tell you the story, when I was a little girl and I had stomach aches and I didn't want to go to school, your brain's going, oh yeah, hmm, yeah, that happened to me. Oh yeah, no, that happened to my sister. Oh, that's what that was. <laughs> your brain woke up, and when I wake up, your brain, you get a little chemical release of dopamine. And that dopamine cascades through your brain, and your brain goes, wow, oh, well, that, wow, I can feel that emotion. And when you can feel emotion, you remember the message. These tips will take the panic out of your presentation because when you're telling stories, you're calming everybody down, right? It's just storytelling. Number three, give your purpose most of your attention. Why are you doing what you're doing? This is how to focus your presentation. Simon Sinek wrote it, start with why, start with why. Apple started with why. Many computer companies did not start with why. Apple is still here because Apple's why was so big, it stands the test of time. Apple wanted to put power in people's hands so that they didn't have to rely on power from outside of themselves. Apple had a big why. When you're standing in front of a group of people, you need to have your why are you there, your general purpose. You also need a specific purpose. I have you here. I know my why. But what do I want you to do with the information? Eradicate disease? Am I close? Am I? And a whole bunch of things I haven't even thought of. You know that. But if you can't get your message across and you don't have a takeaway for that person in the audience, it will get lost, right? You know, they'll, Go check their messages on their phone and your message is lost. So your general purpose is why are you speaking? And here are the choices. You are either to inform or educate, maybe inspire or motivate. And getting a good grade is OK. That's an OK purpose. Yeah, I'm doing this presentation because I have to. That's a purpose. All right, that's OK. But your specific purpose, purpose is asking yourself, after I deliver that presentation, what do I want the listener to do with the information? And that allows you to prepare your material in digestible pieces that the audience can receive. And it's not about you. It's not about how smart you are. It's about, did I deliver to the audience information that they could do something with, that they needed to receive, not showing off how smart I am, right? Because the audience is the center of my universe, right? And I've got a relationship to them. And now I want to be on task. Go ahead. Prepare your presentation. Make it clear and consistent and concise. And do that before you add the slides. OK, I confess. I always start with my PowerPoint now. I'm going to write my speech. Oh. Then I'm like, oh, look at that picture. Oh, look at that. And now my daughter's introduced me to Giphy's. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm like. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have a general purpose. I don't have a specific purpose. I forgot about my audience because I'm focused on my PowerPoint. Write your presentation first. Once your presentation's in place, then you can add it. But make sure they're purposeful and they're sparingly done. We all know it. You've seen a 1,000 of them, right? It's all about the PowerPoint. And my next slide, and my next slide. And you're like, check in. Uh, yeah, Instagram. I'm going to clean out. You know what I do? I clean out my inbox. I'm going to get rid of 200 emails right now when they show those PowerPoint slides. Less is more on slides. Less is more in everything. Do not make your audience read them. They came to hear your voice and see your body present the information. If you are writing text so that they are reading your slides, delete it and avoid reading to an audience because they came to hear you. So the power of the cue card is delightful. Try to avoid the flipping of your papers. And if you can just get them on a little recipe card and just start to put keywords. I know you have data-heavy presentations, so <laughs> don't get me wrong. I know you need to. But where you can, get it onto cue cards. The audience, there's nothing worse than, oh, good, she's going to read another page. Oh, my, how many pages has she got left, right? <laughs> they came to see you, which leads us to body language. I'm going to get you moving a little on body language, because nobody likes this one. Who's shy about speaking in front of people? Anybody shy standing in front of people? And Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hard. 
Do you know how much of your speech is received non-verbally by your audience? <clears throat> Just guess a percentage. What percentage of your speech is non-verbal? 18%? How much? 80%? Anyone else? You're cheating. You were in my course. Um, uh, anyone else? Because it's actually higher. Yeah. Minimum 50%, up to 93% of your presentation is nonverbal. Nonverbal. It's what they see, it's what they hear, and it's how they feel about your delivery. It's a big number. And it puts a lot of pressure on body language. So let me give you some quick little tips on body language, all right? I intentionally am not standing over here because I wanted to show you. Well, first of all, how much of my body just got cut off? Yeah, so what percentage are you seeing of me? 50%? Yeah. I'm not saying you need to start standing in front of people. Not yet. But work towards it because people are reading your body language, right? Own the podium. And what does that mean? It means the minute you are introduced by a speaker, you claim the space because you have five minutes to, to harness the energy of your message, and nobody else owns that space but you. And if you come up and you're like, yeah, I'm here, and I, you know, whatever. I hope they don't listen to me. Yeah. Now I'm just going to read my PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, I should have put that on cue cards, so I'll do that next time. Right? You didn't, you've got to own the podium. The minute you're in front of people, you owe it to them to make them the center of your universe, right? You are the commander of that ship. Bring them in. But, you know, this stuff, yeah, own the podium. Get grounded. All right, we're going to stand. Who knows about grounding their two legs into the earth? Where are my yoga people? Yeah. When you speak, especially when you're going to stand in front of people, you need the old tried and true trick, two feet below your hips, lined up with your shoulders, and you need to ground. So I am not a guru, but I know this. I shoot the energy of my being through my feet, through the earth, and I imagine that it goes right down to the center of the earth. And I am grounded here. And then I shoot it up through my head, through the ceiling, up to the top, and I ground it to the top of me. I never stand in front of people without being grounded here and here. Who's good at grounding? Anybody got a good practice with yoga and grounding? Yeah. And, and you know what? I could tell who's, who's good at grounding because when you stood up, you looked really grounded. So your two legs are tree trunks when you're going to stand in front of people. When you ground, you transfer your fear and anxiety, right? It's like discharging it, right? You are now between two polarities, and you are grounded. Grounded and breathing. Now you're calm. So own the podium when it's your time to speak and get grounded. Watch this. All right, have a seat. Watch my, watch my body language change. So here's, here's not grounded. Can you see the difference? Here's grounded. Not grounded? Grounded? Can you see the difference? Right. So you think you're behind the podium, no one's going to see my legs. Or worse, no one's going to see my hands in my pockets. Uh, yeah. Or how about this? How about the presenter that doesn't face the audience? How about the, here, I'm just going to give you a little bit of me. Not all of me. Nope, not all of me. I'm going to give you a little bit. Face on, get grounded, own the podium. All right. And posture matters. Yep, your mom was right. I can't believe this one. I have two children, and I have struggled because do I look particularly convincing like this? Or do I look like I might have something to say like this? Posture, posture. All right, I'm not going to make you to stand for this, but I want you to do this. Shoulders up to your ears. Gently back here, and then let them fall right in their natural sockets. Now take a breath. Is there more room? Nod your head yes, or shake your head no, and let it out slowly. So not only does your posture make you look more powerful, it gives you more room for the oxygen, which is going to bathe your brain and take the panic out. So when you're like this, and you're not, you just cut off your oxygen supply. So at the very least, your posture gives you more ac access to oxygen. Grounded legs, on the podium, shoulders back, be able to take a breath. So if I lose my place, I am one breath away from getting back, right? One breath. 
It's right there. Something else about posture I wanted to share with you, and this is Amy Cuddy. Ted talked. Anyone watched Amy Cuddy's Power Postures? Yes. Okay. And I'll put that in the link that I send you. You have to watch Amy Cuddy talk about power posturing. Because not only do we have a primitive brain, but we have a brain that says when we go like this, we are big and powerful. And not only that, it releases testosterone. It, whoa, I can feel it. No, I'm just joking. I'm kidding. It takes longer than that. <laughs> Two minutes in front of the mirror. When you do this, your brain, and you look at yourself, your brain releases testosterone because it says, oh my god, she had to get bigger. There's a fight coming. But it actually lowers your cortisol. It lowers your anxiety hormones. So just standing in front of the mirror in your power pose, superwoman pose, for two minutes before you speak gives you a chemical advantage to anybody else in that room. Up to testosterone, down to cortisol. Good, nice posture. Think big. Amy Cuddy, you've got to see her TED talk on that. Uh, and listen to her story, because it's 60% of her speech. It's why she got 2 million hits on her TED talk. So what about my hands? Oh my god, what am I going to do with my hands? OK, just don't put them in your pocket, right? Uh, nods is a good little thing because nobody should listen to you when you're like this. And even behind the podium, if you're here, you're closed off to your audience. So at least have them down by your side, which is neutral in a bit of an open body language. And when you're going to use them, just be definite about it. Because this is kind of a drag. Well, I was thinking when I did my research of looking into this one, but I looked into that one. And that's OK. Or when I looked at my research, I was surprised to know that that was possible. Right? So my body language is, is much more pleasurable for you to, to watch and take in. All right, what should I wear? Oh my gosh, I struggle with this all the time. Do not let your wardrobe be your speech. Do not let what you're wearing be your message, because that's about you. And if your clothing distracts from your presentation, you did not make your audience the center of your universe. It is not about the clothes that you're wearing. So don't make it about the clothes you're wearing. And what I mean by that is watch see-through things. Watch things that show off parts of you that might be distracting for people, whatever that is for you. Learn how to cover up your imperfections and, and, and just be you know, tasteful about it. But business casual is never a bad bet. And I know at different levels at, uh, for presentations, but you're going to not be here forever, and you're going to be out in the world and interviewing. And you can't go wrong with business casual. And you'll usually go wrong with see-through white t-shirts. That's for sure. So be mindful about what you wear, because how much of your message is nonverbal? Eat. 50 to 93 percent. And they, we do judge what we see. So make sure what they see is in line with your presentation, right? Just make it in line with your presentation, which is why I didn't wear a bikini today. <laughs> and practice, practice, practice. Yeah, do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice, practice, practice. You do. You practice, and you have some pretty cool nifty devices now. Always read your presentation in front of the mirror. Start there, for sure. Start making eye contact with yourself so that you can make eye contact with your audience. If I can't look myself in the eye, I can't look you in the eye. And people are seeking connection. Use your voice recorder. So I do this all the time. And all I, I just have to hear myself once. I go, oh my god, that sounds horrible. But it works. <laughs> so record your presentation on your phone and then listen back. I guarantee the next time you say it, you'll say it better. Because you don't know how you sound. So record it. And, and we have a camera here so that I have to painfully watch this later. And we have a camera gal in the room who's on Project Explorer. She knows all about this. Get the video camera out and tape yourself. And then make yourself look at it, which I have to admit is really tough for me. And uh, I was on a TV show, <laughs> and I had the DVDs. I 20 years later, I actually watched the episodes. That's awful. So I'm not a good example of that. I'm just saying to you, get used to looking at yourself, because you'll, of course, correct really quickly. All right, number five is color your vocal variety. Does anyone know what vocal variety is? What is vocal variety? Yeah. Yeah, tone of your voice. So vocal variety is really important. Otherwise, this will happen. 
Okay, you need to keep your audience awake. You need to insert inflection because monotone is monotonous and you will put people asleep and you want them awake because you have really good information, right? So vocal variety, really quick. This is a three hour workshop. I'm just doing it really quickly right here. But vocal variety is pitch, talking really high or really low. That's your pitch. If you have a pitchy voice or a voice sound you don't like, just start listening to it on your iPhone, all right? Once you hear yourself, your brain's going to go, whoa, really? OK, let's change that. That's what you have to do. Just listen to yourself. It's a little biofeedback. Vocal variety is the rhythm, the pace, the pause, the power of the pause in a presentation. I'm about to tell you the next piece of information and, and everyone's like, what's she going to say? Oh my god, she's got something important. So that is vocal variety. But a quick fix, if you don't know what to do with vocal variety, is pretend you're talking to a friend. Your presentation is conversational. I know that because when you're talking, I was on campus today and I heard all these great stories about everyone's weekend and there's all this beautiful pitch and inflection and rhythm and it's interesting. So tip number one, when you're talking to an audience, just pretend you're talking to a friend. And I told Zoe this earlier, I always place my best friend in the fourth seat of the fourth aisle and I start my presentation talking to her. Because when I'm talking to Jocelyn from Newfoundland, I always have vocal variety, right? So I want you to think forever that your audience is just a friend that you're having a conversation with and deliver your riveting data and material as though it's a friend. Because when you do, you go up and then you go down and then you're all over and then you say, and then, right, vocal variety, that is the quick fix. Make it a conversation. Last point, get really good at this part. I saw this the other day. I'm not used to the Q&A parts as much. But you want to get really good at them because you're, you guys introduce them. I was impressed to see how you have your introducers introduce your Q&A. How many of you like standing up there after your presentation and the nice girl says, you know, any questions and you're standing there and nobody says anything? Who loves that? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm like, want to die. I want to die when that happens. Don't let it happen. Take total control of your Q&A. Have a couple of questions inside of you about your presentation. And in fact, as much as I love the person saying that at the end, I'd say, you know, Melanie, thanks for starting this question and answer period. One of the questions I had with my research that I wasn't really sure about was this. So while you're thinking about a question you might have for me, start talking. Do not leave the room in dead silence. Have a couple of questions about your presentation in your back pocket. The other thing, really important in Q&A, when someone asks you a question, repeat the question so everybody knows what the question was. And we all forget that. People over here do not hear people over here. And now you're at the end of your great presentation rambling on about something, and that person the whole time is going, huh? What's she talking about? Uh, what, what are they talking about? So a trick to impromptu speaking is to repeat the question to buy some time. Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking me that. The question was that he just asked me over here is, and now I've stalled 10, 15 seconds for my little brain to go, oh my god, I don't know the answer to that question. OK, well, it doesn't matter, because Suzanne always said, just repeat the question out loud and buy time. So you buy your time. Maybe you know the answer. Well, the answer to that question that you've just said out loud, say it. If you don't know the answer, say, you know what? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone else know the answer to that? And then you get your question and answer, and it's not about you anymore. You still need to control that. But you do have wise professors. I've seen this. You've got great people in the room. You can deflect it to, to someone else in the room. You can, at any age, take the panic out of public speaking. You can breathe. You can apply some of these tips. And you can get your message out to people. Any questions? Thank you.